All right, so, and now uh, welcome our next speaker. So, Javier Calpe from Analog Devices, Spain. So Thank you very you. much, Alina. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, thanks to the organization for inviting me for this talk. Uh, my name is Javier Calpe and I work for Analog Devices in a Development Center in Valencia, Spain. And I want to change a little bit and, and I think that uh, I choose a topic which is halfway between uh, electronics and uh, let's say society life, okay? We are all concerned about uh, our corporate social responsibility, about our social responsibility with the planet. And I wanted to discuss uh, how we can, uh, let's say, reduce our free footprint in the world as uh, digital designers, or as analog designers. Okay, and we typically try to find about big things and what I want to talk about is that how our good design is going to impact the, let's say, the attempts that we are doing to, uh, let's say, get to carbon neutral and uh, make our growth sustainable. Okay, one of the big advantages of working in a company like ADI is that you have the opportunity to work with people who are the fathers of this technology. And one of these cases is Bob Adams, okay, who has received several prizes from the IEEE and is the, the, the father of the Sigma Delta converters and an audio signal guru. And he was giving a talk about reducing the noise in cars. And I was asking him a very naive question. And I said, Bob, do we really need to enjoy La Macarena with high audio field quality in our car? And Bob said, no, Javier, this is not about audio quality. This is about reducing the weight in the cars for isolating the noise. At that point, it was diesel engines mostly reducing the, the noise of the car, okay? So having said this, I mean, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, first introduce briefly the company, uh, then we'll talk about two examples, noise cancellation and motor control, and that will conclude with some final remarks, okay? Analog devices. It's a big company. Uh, I mean, we are more than 50 years in the business uh, since uh, 66. Uh, we are a big company, 9.1 billion in sales, and we are an IDM. IDM means like SD before that we design, but we also manufacture uh, our own chips. And especially we manufacture what is difficult, okay, what it's not, what you can do, let's say in TSMC, you do in TSMC. <coughs> We do the, the funny things that are difficult to, to do. So we have factories in, in, uh, in the US and also a, a big factory in Limerick, Ireland. And uh, one of the things I wanted to, to highlight here is that I see that every company, and in particular in my company, put a lot of emphasis on sustainability. And we take seriously our commitment with the planet, okay? So by 2025, we are going to reduce 50% of our uh, CO2 emissions, 50% water recycling, and we are going to use 100% renewable energy in our factories. And we are investing in sustainable technologies. So we are doing that by, let's say, um, high tech, like uh, 5G, advanced digital healthcare, electrical vehicles, or uh, renewable. So I'm going to try to show this a little bit. And one of the areas, or one of the industries that is contributing more to pollution is automotive industry, okay? And what is obvious is that lighter is greener, okay? It's a, it's a way to save uh, pollution. And one of the problems is, is the noise that, that we have in the car, okay? We have noise from different sources. Uh, the engine noise it was particularly problematic in, in classical combustion, combustion engines. Now with electrical vehicles, it's not so much. But then you have the road noise that is now becoming a problem, and wind noise also. And this is important because this uh, can be also a distraction for the driver and can let's say, create problems with safety while driving. Okay, so it's important to reduce the noise in the cockpit. And the classical ways of doing that by putting mechanical barriers uh, has a cost, which is basically the weight. Okay, you are adding something like 40 kilos to the, to the car, even with the best technologies, and that means an extra fuel consumption. Okay, so how can we do that? So basically what we do is to, as, as was mentioned before, put a lot of sensors in the car and monitor what's happening in the cockpit and monitor what's happening in the engine and uh, create 
uh, noise that can compensate for the uh, that noise generated or can create sound, sorry, that can compensate from that noise so that the different uh, people in the cockpit can have a better experience and don't be distracted by the noise and even increase their, let's say, the quality of driving and enjoy more the music. And you do this by different techniques and you distribute mix microphones around the car and you generate what we call a virtual or remote microphones that is trying to simulate what the person is really listening in in his position in his head position even though you don't have a microphone there and we compensate for it and this has to be done in a very rough environment because you have a lot of echoes you have small distances you have a lot of noise and you have to be compensating for it so basically our objective here is to reduce 5 db which is good enough you have uh, 400 to 300 uh, bandwidth for cancellation of the noise. If you want to go farther with that, you need to put loudspeakers on the headrests because otherwise you cannot go to, to higher frequencies. Okay, so in that way, we can reduce the noise and have a better perception. And another point here is, is harnessing, okay? Already in the 70s, we started putting a lot of cabling and electronics in the car, okay? I don't know if it's true or not, but it said that in the 80s, Mercedes was doing a, a car and they realized that they couldn't close the driver's uh, uh, door because there was a big uh, bunch of cables going through there. Okay, so that was when Robert Boyce and others worked on the, on the CAN, okay, in the control area network, defining a bus that could be reliable and could be applied uh, to cars. Okay, and this has reduced a lot the harnessing and thus the weight of the cars. And okay, but even though that's that's true, the electronics are increasing in the car, so the weight of uh, copper is still relevant and growing in the car. Okay, so one of the things that we did, for example, in, in analog devices was to uh, create a, an audio bus that would have the speed that would work with just uh, 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 copper without any uh, insulation, very low power. So we believe that in the first decade of production of these A to B, these audio to, to bit converters, we are going to save uh, 2 million tons of uh, uh, CO2 and reduce the, the, the let's say, the, the consumption of copper in the cars. And Bus, buses definitely are lighter, okay, and these days in the cars everything is connected and we, for example, we, we have another bus which is the C2B for, for higher bandwidths and in this way you can connect the multiple cameras that you have in your cars and you can create these virtual images of your car to, to make driving, uh, let's say, safer and, and easier to do. And then if we change a little bit the gears and talk about industry. Now there is a talk about industry 5.0. Okay, if industry 4.0 was about efficiency, was about producing more goods <laughs> and faster and cheaper. Industry 5.0, it's about producing in a sustainable way, okay, in a way that can be respectful with the, with the planet. And definitely motors are important. We need to, uh, let's say, manage motors uh, with more intelligence in order to, to achieve this. And I want to, I borrowed uh, this slide from, from my CEO in a conference uh, that he gave in the IMEC uh, ITF this year, which was a very interesting conference. And he was talking about uh, combining, in order to solve the problems that we have today, combining the three dimensions that, that we have for innovation. One is the kind of more and more in the sense of reducing the nodes and, 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 and squeezing more transistors in, in the chip. The other is the more than more is like adding uh, passives, uh, doing, using uh, chiplets, uh, using biochips to make things more imaginative on silicon. But the other uh, dimension that we need to exploit is to address the problem holistically. And part of it is is developing algorithms, but also algorithms that interact with the hardware. So it's not like a, an additional layer that you have a, a fixed hardware and then software running on top of it and then something at higher level, okay? That there's a communication and there is a lot of flexibilities in the system to allow innovation as much as possible, okay? And one of the examples I want to give is that how we tackled uh, in, in analog devices this problem of controlling motors. And one of the problems is, okay, we need a very low power ADC. Okay, so if we take this 
classical graph with a figure of merit, this is where our system uh, is located. This is where our chip is, is located, okay? Because there are a lot of uh, elements that contribute to the consumption of the elements in, a, in an application. And especially now that we have a lot of sensors and we have a lot of them are uh, using batteries, it's very important to maximize the duration of, of those elements because otherwise we're going to incur in high costs and also this is going to impact the planet because we're going to create a lot of waste. And we, in uh, my colleague Gerard uh, Mora in, in Valencia, uh, led the design of this ultra low power ADC. I'm not going to get into detail of that, but basically he rethink he rethought all the um, all the uh, elements, all the blocks, trying to squeeze all the power that he could. And one of the decisions, for example, was the, was the PGA architecture. Uh, there are, let's say, two classical options. One is the, the safe uh, resistor based, and the other one is based on capacitors. And we decided to go with the capacitor ones because that was going to give us a huge advantage in consumption. And he succeeded in, in, in delivering this, this part that is now in the market. Another aspect that we try to, to tackle is optimizing motors, okay? We have a motor and we say, okay, can we learn what are the uh, parameters of that motor while it's working in order to be able to better control it and better drive it, okay? So that's something that, that we did and, and together with my colleague, uh, Adam Glibery, we developed a, a system that, that was patented earlier this year to extract the parameters to better control uh, AC motors uh, in operation. And one of the aspects of this is that if you have that power of controlling the motors, if you can sensor motors, you can predict when the motors are going to fail and even take preventive actions to avoid them from failing. Or if, you, if they are going to fail, you just go there, repair, knowing exactly what is the piece that is let's say faulty, so that you're going to reduce the waste because you're going to extend the life of the motors, you're going to minimize the impact on other things, and this is something that it's very relevant now in, in industry, the, the, the predictive maintenance aspect of it, okay? And one of the areas that, or one of the chiefs that are doing this are the accelerometers, okay? So it's important to have very accurate accelerometers down to DC that can be monitoring these things and and detecting strange vibrations in order to predict. And this is all, of course, combined with, um, let's say, intelligence and uh, machine learning and cloud processing in order to uh, extract all this information. And finally, there is another avenue here, which is, okay, typically now the world was ruled by, by big AC motors, but we see a trend now of moving to a smaller DC motors that can be controlled uh, uh, very, let's say, specifically as, as uh, smart units. And uh, we in ADI, there's a company, uh, we acquired a company in Hamburg, in Germany, called Trinamic, that have, are developing a complete set of algorithms in order to control uh, these uh, smaller uh, DC motors and uh, let's say make them more efficient and also be able to predict any issue because before it, it really manifests itself, okay? So uh, using these techniques, we are able to reduce power consumption by 90% uh, in continuous run. We have uh, advanced motion control algorithms that allow a better reliability and a better precision and also reduces the wear out and we can integrate, better integrate that so we are making lighter elements which, are, which is reducing also the, the, the um, let's say the carbon footprint in their applications. And one of the things that now this team is developing is, a, is a, an IC that is integrating everything on a single part so we have the analog front ends to capture uh, all the signals for uh, current, voltage, and position, and drive the motors, and all the algorithms to, to let's say, process uh, the, the different uh, needs of the motor uh, in order to drive them in an efficient way. So, having said this, uh, I want to finish with some concluding remarks, okay? One is that 
we are facing a real huge problem that is relevant for all of us, okay? It's the, the global warming is a reality. Uh, we have all agreed trying to minimize it and fix it to 1.5 degrees by 2050. But the truth is that if we do nothing, the growth is going to be uh, almost three degrees, okay? And this is a huge problem for our planet. So we have to take, be conscious about this and try to do the best to, uh, to avoid this. And what is true is that our need for energy is growing and will continue growing because we, we have to continue grow, growing. But the, the strategies to uh, avoid this becoming a problem for the environment is that if we compare our needs of power from 2020 to 2025, we see that basically we are doubling them. But the truth is that half of it can be avoided by using more energy efficient techniques, okay? By better controlling the, the things, by better monitoring the stuff and not wasting energy. And from that other 50%, half of it could be obtained from renewable energies. So basically that means that even though we are doubling our needs of energy, theoretically, we should be consuming or we could be consuming less than half of the energy that we are consuming now, okay? And I think that this has to be a commitment for everybody. And uh, I think that I was very pleased attending that conference in IMEC uh, back in May that I saw all the industry very focused on this because also we see a business reason for it, okay? So which is important that too. And am I optimistic about this? Definitely, I think that technology is our biggest tool to succeed and uh, we have all the commitment to, to do that. And uh, let's see, more important than, than technology is common sense and love. And I'm, I have a positive view, okay? I'm, I'm positive. Back in March 2020, when COVID restrictions started to be applied, I said, okay, I'm not going to shave because this is going to take two weeks to get fixed, so I'm not going to shave for these two weeks, okay? And this was me in Christmas that year, <laughs> okay? So definitely that shows that I'm committed and optimistic, and thanks God I could get shaved because this is almost over. Thanks a million. Thank you. Here. So, uh, questions? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, sorry? Audio cancellation works well. <laughs> uh, you said like uh, you have like a way to uh, prevent um, problems with like uh, electrical engines and how does it like work? It's like sends a warning for a, a piece that is like wearing out. How does it work properly? Okay, there are different things. Definitely you, you need to put sensors there. There are different technologies that you can apply. I mean, we, we have attacked the problem, let's say from different aspects. You can be monitoring the current. You can have magnetic sensors there to check the magnetic field. Uh, the easiest way is maybe just to measure the vibration of the motor, okay? If things are going smoothly, there's going to be very minimum vibration, basically. If things start going a little bit dodgy, you're going to find more vibration there. And you can generate or you can detect the profiles of these vibrations and relay them with, uh, let's say, particular problems in the sense that some of the elements, mechanical elements, are getting uh, degraded or faulty. Some, a, a way of doing that, for example, is just to have the, an engine running and measure that and get a signature of the problem so that you, you see that something fun is happening and then after uh, 10,000 hours, you open the motor and see which pieces are degrading. Other aspects, for example, is just to identify uh, changes in the profile and maybe you cannot say exactly what's happening but showing that there is something happening in that engine and that has to be monitored. So there is a different level of, for very critical motors where you have a lot, a huge production depending on them, just any sign of wear out of degradation can be relevant. For most of the motors, what we can do is predict errors in the 90% of the most common problems that they are going to have weeks before they happen. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Javier, thank you very much for, again, great talk. Uh, it was very educational uh, for me as well to see how electronics is coming to the cars, and I guess there's a lot of work in this area. Uh, you mentioned uh, one way to reduce noise for the passengers inside the car is to essentially listen to the noise that is being created and then try to compensate for it. I understand that another way maybe complementary to this is to also design the shape of certain um, for example, the, the car mirror creates a lot of noise because that's yes. right in front of um, the, the wind. And so is, is that a, a, a combination of work that can be done here in order to optimize the shape and perhaps reduce the noise further at the beginning before listening and reducing it? Absolutely, and I think that's a great point. And I think that relates with that slide I was showing about combinatorial innovation. Okay, I mean, electronics is great. But if you can fix it with a sticker, fix it with a sticker. Okay, don't put, don't put a two microprocessors number crunching. Okay, so I think it's it's a combination of things. So uh, good mechanical design is critical. Uh, good materials or or appropriate materials is, are critical. For example, now we are participating in a European PhD network dedicated to these things, and it's a combination of people from architecture, people from pure mechanics, uh, people from electronics, signal processing, and we are working together trying to, uh, let's say, develop new ways of mitigating noise in planes, in cars, or even engines, okay, so that it's not so aggressive to get into a factory and having to, to wear ear protection uh, in order to, to do that. So definitely, I think that Electronics is great, but if you can fix with uh, with something else, let's do that. Okay, let's don't just. I mean, maybe now you are in the age that you have to fix in the transistor, and that's great. But when you get a little bit more mature, okay, don't try to fix everything with a transistor. Okay, ha try to have a look at the big picture. I mean, uh, we saw a great example before with that combination of the optics, the mechanical design, the electronics. If, if you insist in doing things just with, uh, I have a hammer, so let's. Let's consider that all problems are nails. That's not the best way. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, so my question was relating to. Um, it was said there that to reduce noise in the cockpit um, above 500 hertz, I believe. Um, it was. There was. Um, talk of introducing speakers to the headrest. Is that something that's being already like commercially done? Yes. Uh, applied to like uh, all ranges of cars, any? Well, I think that everything is done if you have enough money, uh, <laughs> deep in, <laughs> or deep pockets. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not mainstream, but uh, there are commercial cars uh, applying these techniques. I mean, the the problem here with this is that you have to detect the noise at the origin or, or, or let's say outside or in the engine and you have to take decisions very quickly to compensate for that in the noise. You simulate a virtual microphone in the ear in order to, to be able to have do the proper minimization of that. But definitely you can only do that for low frequencies. Because I mean, there's not enough time to react, and the only way to to react to it is to try to, in order, let's say, to win more time, is to have the the loudspeakers very close so that you have more time to calculate, and then you can hit your your ears faster. So yeah, that's that's true. Sorry. Sorry. Well, one last question. You talked in one of the slides how the copper use was decreasing with um, in the car company. I was thinking, okay, combustion cars probably have a lot of copper in the wires, in the alternator. But nowadays, with more and more electric cars, I imagine that the motors will take a lot of uh, weight in, in copper. Um, are we currently looking for solutions to that, or the 
we will see a, a very large increase in the copper use in cars. Well, uh, what I, sorry, because maybe this was not clear enough or I moved too fast. What this is showing is that in fact, uh, let's say the, the copper is, is increasing in these three years. It increased, I mean, this is, I see this global average. Despite the efforts in, in, in using buses and minimizing it and, and using, for example, the, what we, when I talked about the C2B, that's just copper pair with no protection. So there's a lot of, let's say, processing in order to be able to transmit those bandwidths there. With electric cars, the weight is, is going to increase. But I mean, this we have to try to minimize everything. One, one area, for example, that we are very active is when you have the batteries there, uh, we are we have now a wireless monitoring of, of every battery cell. So there is no need to be cabling all the cells in order to sense them. Okay, so there's a, a wireless network there that, that uh, allows you to reduce the, the, the complexity and extra weight of cabling the, the different battery cells in the car. So that, that's, that's always going to be a, a, a run, I mean, the more you, you allow, then th there will be something else coming, and we have always to think about it. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the world's energy consumption will like double till 2050. Well, not really consumption, let's say, if, if we, with the growth expected, if we were applying the same techniques, basically our needs will double uh, by 2050. And uh, the idea, and again, you can argue that this is a kind of marketing slide, even though it's not mine, it's not ADI, it's, it's from a, an NGO. So basically, the, the, the need for power with the growth expected will be more than double. But the idea is that half of it is going to be avoided because we are going to be much more efficient in the use that we make for it. I mean, we're going to be much more <coughs> accurate in driving motors. We are going to be, uh, let's say, get, doing chips that consume less and less power every time. And this is something that every company, I think all companies are very committed to this. So we are going to save half of it just because we are going to design better. Why is the power consumption increasing? Which markets or which applications? This is all, uh, this is considering all markets and the all applications, world, yes. Yes. I mean, if I can show you the, the study where this was coming from, but uh, there was, this is a, a think tank that produced this analysis. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.